Welcome all to today's radiology grand rounds from Health Hub for the World on imaging of pediatric serious infections with Dr. Asa Sharma. Hi, um, thank you for having me so much, Shiva, and uh, and thank you for uh, Dr. Rehani for inviting me. So, Dr. Asha uh, graduated from University of Utah Medical School and did her residency program at. Uh, Brigham's and Women's Hospital, and then she stayed in Boston and did her fellowship from Boston Children's Hospital. We are very excited to have you here, and uh, I hope it, it is a great session. I thank hand you, it over to you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you for having me. Thank you for those who are attending and those who are watching uh, offline afterward. Um, my The topic of my presentation is imaging of the pediatric central nervous system uh, infections. And uh, my name is Asha Sarma and I'm from Vanderbilt in Nashville, Tennessee. This is a picture of the front of the hospital there where I work. Um, I'll be using Poll Everywhere during this presentation, so if you want to join, um, you can go to polleverywhere.com. This is the web link, and uh, this will show up on all the Poll Everywhere slides as well, um, or during the activities, you can text ASARMA242 to 22333 to join and then enter your answer. Um, so uh, this is just a brief outline of the presentation. So this is not meant to be kind of an exhaustive review of imaging pediatric central nervous system infections, which is a really, really broad topic. Uh, but rather, uh, I just wanted to touch on some of the uh, main points um, of just kind of helpful things for more common uh, infections and more uh, commonly tested things um, one might, might see. Um, there are probably many on this call who have more experience um, with uh, parasitic and fungal infections. I'm really only going to touch on um, the topics of congenital infections uh, and compare and contrast some of the imaging findings you might see in some of the more common um, ones and uh, to look at more common viral and bacterial CNS infections and some of the imaging manifestations that might be seen with a special focus on meningitis and its complications. In terms of congenital infections, uh, the uh, goals are to recall and recognize key features of congenital CMV. And I have this highlighted in bold because congenital CMV is one of the most common ones that we'll see. Um, it has pretty characteristic imaging findings. And I'm going to use that kind of as a foil to compare and comp contrast with toxoplasmosis, uh, Zika virus infection and congenital HIV. Um, we'll be differentiating these uh, entities mainly on the basis of comparison of the head size of the patient, the presence of cortical malformations, and the presence of and pattern of calcifications. Um, and then the next goal is to be familiar with the mimics uh, that you can see of the torch infections. So just some general background concepts about congenital infections. Um, so there are two main routes of transmission. There are ascending infections, uh, which are mainly bacterial infections that come from the birth process uh, versus transplacental infections uh, that, that are usually viral or parasitic infections. Another important thing to know is that fetuses have a different biological response to injury than more uh, patients with more mature CNS they don't have uh, the ability to form gliosis uh, or inflammation in the same way as, as older, um, uh, more mature patients. And there's more removal and replacement of abnormal tissue instead. And so one really interesting thing is that the effect of the infection uh, dip and or really any insult for that matter, including a vascular insult, depends uh, more on the timing rather than the nature of the insult in many cases. So this little table at the top right shows some of the different processes that go on during embryonic life and how there are different processes occurring during the different trimesters. So during the first trimester, oftentimes uh, more severe manifestations such as high drops or fetal loss may occur um, early on in the second trimester, the brain tissue that gets um, damaged is replaced with abnormal uh, tissue um, with, with cortical malformations, more severe cortical malformations like agyria or pachygyria. You might see cerebellar hypoplasia um, or vent and uh, more severe um, ventriculomegaly. Whereas if the injury is later on and more of these processes have occurred, you might see uh, less severe cortical malformations like polymicrogyria or schizencephaly. Uh, 
And then during the third trimester, the brain has sort of already undergone many of these uh, processes such as neuronal migration. So you might see manifestations such as myelin delay or destruction and less severe ventriculomegaly. So I'm going to show you some images from a case, and next we'll move to a poll everywhere question. So um, just take a moment to look at these images and uh, get a sense of what you think the findings might be. And then we're going to go to the question. So top left, we have a plain film. Um, it's kind of hard to see here on the screen, perhaps, but focusing on uh, the appearance of the liver, which is also shown here on the ultrasound. Um, T1 weighted brain MRI, uh, coronal head ultrasound, coronal T2 weighted MRI, and axial T2 weighted MRI. So here's the question. So which presentation is most common in this disorder? Is it A, gelastic seizures, B, hearing loss, C, blindness, D, hydrocephalus, or E, sepsis? And I'll give you about 30 seconds uh, to pitch in. So maybe you don't need 30 seconds because the only answer that I'm seeing here is, is hearing, oh, here we go. Somebody is putting in blindness. Okay, so we have kind of an even split between hearing loss and blindness. So um, let's talk about the findings that we're seeing on these images. So I had been showing you on the previous slide some hepatosplenic uh, calcifications. And on the brain imaging, you can see these uh, hyperechoic areas in the paraventricular white matter that represent calcifications, also seen here on the T2-weighted MRI, also seen here on the T1-weighted uh, image. Sometimes these calcifications are actually easier to see on ultrasound than they are on MRI. And here I'm showing you some kind of prominent temporal horns of the lateral ventricles and perhaps some white matter changes, which we'll talk about a little bit more on subsequent slides. And here there's kind of an abnormal gyral pattern that you can see in both frontal lobes. Um, so the answer in this case is uh, cytomegalovirus infection. And so those are some of the common Im imaging manifestations that one might see. Um, and sensory neural hearing loss is one of the most common manifestations of disease. So um, CMV is very common. Up to 35,000 patients a year are infected in the U.S. Um, only about 10% uh, of these present with what's called CMV disease, uh, which is a symptomatic a manifestation of the infection. And so these patients with the CMV disease have worse neurodevelopmental outcomes beyond sensory neural hearing loss, such as developmental delay or seizures especially if their imaging findings are abnormal. And their prognosis can be improved with gancyclovir administration. And the cause of the brain manifestations is thought to be infection of the germinal matrix or vascular insult. And here's just an image of uh, where the germinal matrix would be on a fetal MRI. So um, congenital CMV infection, as I said, a common reason, uh, a common way that this is diagnosed in our practice is a patient is referred for imaging for sensory neural hearing loss. And you might not see any inner ear abnormalities on the imaging because the hearing loss is thought to occur because of damage at the cellular level, which we can't currently see on imaging, of course. So the next thing that I'll do is I'll go and uh, look at the patient's growth chart and see if the patient has microcephaly, because that's a really common and important manifestation of congenital CMV infection. Then uh, other things I might look for on the imaging are periventricular calcification, which are tend to be finer calcifications you can see here on this schematic and also on the CT image and the, the ultrasound that I had shown you before. Um, and then you would go and look for cortical malformations such as polymicrogyrus. So here you can see increased gyral frequency and abnormal sulcation, typical of diffuse bilateral polymicrogyria in this case. Um, and this is the same patient. So another important finding you might see is abnormalities in the anterior temporal lobes, such as white matter signal abnormality. You can see the T2 hyperintense white matter with cysts, as well as dilatation of the temporal horns. And so this schematic helps us remember that there's abnormal sulcation uh, with polymicrogyria and periventricular calcifications. Another common finding that we tend to see is white matter abnormalities, such as gliosis um, or delayed white matter myelination and uh, or dysmyelination. So here is an example of a patient who had uh, cortical malformations, and you can see these very typical changes of T2 prolongation within the posterior paraventricular white matter, um, also the, in this patient seen in the uh, frontal white matter as well. <laughs> 
This is an example of what might happen, as I said before, earlier in the second trimester, if the infection occurs earlier, the cortical malformation might be more severe, such as in this patient with the pachygyria uh, type of pattern of cortical malformation or even lisencephaly. Um, and here is an example of the cerebellar malformations that might occur. This patient, usually the cerebellar folia should parallel the occipital bone. In this case, you can see this kind of uh, crenulated appearance of the cerebellum with a um, abnormal foliar pattern. Next, we'll move to congenital toxoplasmosis. Excuse me. <clears throat> this um, is more rare than uh, congenital CMV, especially in the United States, but uh, may occur up to one in a thousand patients in endemic areas. And one important clinical manifestation is the patients will present with chorioretinitis. Um, key features on imaging that differentiate congenital toxoplasmosis from CMV infection are rather than being microcephalic, the patients are normal or even macrocephalic. Um, and that is because of the tendency toward hydrocephalus, which is because of ependymitis and aqueductal obstruction. So typically the ventricles will be enlarged. Also, the, the character of the calcifications is quite different. So you might see cortical and subcortical calcifications, as well as periventricular and basal ganglia calcifications, which differs from that periventricular type of calcification you see in congenital CMV. Malformations of cortical development are rare. And as I said before, hydrocephalus is very common. Okay, so now we're on our next poll everywhere question, so shifting gears to a different case. Um, so what is the uh, suspected source of infection in, um, in this patient with head circumference that's less than the first percentile? So up top, we've got a T2-weighted axial MRI image, then we've got a T1-weighted axial image, and a uh, gradient echo image showing some areas of susceptibility effects. So we've got some for mosquito bite, some for animal contact, which I guess mosquito bite is kind of animal contact, but I didn't really think about that when I was putting together the question. We'll see if anybody else comes in with anything else. Okay, and kind of in the interest of time, I'll, um, I'll move on to the answer to this question. So here um, we're seeing a patient with uh, a very um, um, abnormal cortical formation here. This is probably a cobblestone malformation, ventriculomegaly, and there are um, gray-white matter junction calcifications. Um, there's a very small head with some redundant skin folds here, you can see of the scalp. And again, those calcifications in the um, subcortical, the gray white matter junction. So this was a, a case of congenital Zika infection. And so um, we saw a lot more of this in the United States, kind of around 2015 and 2016 is when this was um, in the news a lot here in the US um, because of an outbreak in the Western hemisphere. Um, but we uh, tend to see this in uh, coming from endemic regions where it's caused by mosquito uh, vector and transmission of a flavivirus, um, Zika virus, and um, the mothers typically have a characteristic rash in the first trimester. So uh, many of you on this call might be able to teach me more about this, and I'd love to learn from you and see your cases. Um, but key features differentiating Zika virus infection from CMV infection include profound microcephaly, so perhaps more than you would see in congenital CMV with the head circumference in the less than fifth percentile, but it may be inappropriately normal if there is a uh, significant enough ventriculomegaly. There are also malformations of cortical development, including most characteristically cobblestone malformation, which is an interesting cortical malformation that occurs because of damage to the peel limiting membrane during the time when the neurons are migrating and they tend to overshoot the pia and end up in the subarachnoid space, hence kind of a little um, mini cobblestone contour of the external aspect of the cortex. Um, the calcifications are predominantly at the gray-white rather than the periventricular, um, or the, sorry, the uh, cortical subcortical junction, and they can also be seen in the basal ganglia and thalamus. So here's a, a picture of a patient showing that very profound microcephaly that you might see, and an imaging, you can see a markedly decreased craniofacial ratio, kind of shelving of the occiput here with, uh, because of sutural overlap because of the microcephaly and the lack of uh, driving of the head growth by the growth of the brain, and these redundant skin folds. So key features that might differentiate um, Zika virus infection from um, CMV 
Um, also include, as I said before, here's just another example showing that cobblestone malformation. So you can see this very fine, lumpy, bumpy, the kind of a thick, almost lysencephalic appearance of the cortex. Lysencephaly is actually a misnomer for this, but um, kind of simulates lysencephaly. Um, and then you can see these calcifications at the gray-white junction. Other important and common features that you might see in congenital Zika virus infection include colossal malformation. So here is a patient who has a parallel orientation of the ventricles typical of agenesis of the corpus callosum as well as ventriculomegaly. Next, um, congenital HIV. This is actually something that I haven't really encountered much in my own practice, but is an important thing to mention in the context of these congenital infections. But nowadays, um, perinatal infections are becoming more rare with highly active antiretroviral therapy and other preventive measures. Um, most of the cases are transmitted during delivery, although can be transmitted at other times, um, such as during breastfeeding. Um, the patients are tend to be normocephalic, or if they do have microcephaly, mildly microcephalic, probably to a lesser extent than the other disorders that we've touched on. Um, and these uh, calcifications are very typical, so you can you may see uh, basal ganglia or subcortical calcifications, uh, especially in the frontal lobes. As this is from uh, the pediatric neuroimaging textbook. Um, and then patients who present later on in the course uh, may present with arteriopathy. Here's a distinctive case that shows some fusiform aneurysms of the MCAs. Um, and indeed, 1% of the patients with uh, congenital HIV infection may present with strokes. Um, now, finally, uh, to wrap this discussion up, we'll touch briefly on a couple of the disorders that can mimic these torch infections. And these are rare. They have uh, both overlapping clinical findings um, with the, and as well as imaging findings with the torch infections, but the patient um, may undergo testing for these congenital infections that will be negative. Um, so the most common of these so-called pseudotorch entities is a cardi Goutier syndrome. Um, and this is a genetic disorder that's caused by mutations in various genes that control immune regulation. So the most common of those is, is TREX1. Um, but this uh, case that I'm showing you here, the patient had a mutation in SAMHD1, which is another uh, one of the genes that, that can be involved. And they have body and skin findings that mimic the torch infection, such as thrombocytopenia or a blueberry muffin rash. And then on imaging, we typically see abnormal white matter. So here you can see all this um, abnormal T2 prolongation and volume loss within the white matter, as well as pro progressive cystic changes, lacunar infarcts, as you can see here. Um, and um, some progressive atrophy. Um, and there are uh, typically parenchymal calcifications as well, which may be in unusual locations such as the brainstem or the basal ganglia. And another really important point to remember is that unlike the torch uh, congenital infections, which tend to be static, um, these mimics tend to be progressive both clinically and on imaging. Here also you can see that this patient had an abnormal um, delayed pattern of myelination. You can see that there's absent myelination within the internal capsule in the 17-month-old patient. So in summary, for these, um, these co more common congenital um, CNS infections in pediatric patients, CMV, you would look for microcephaly, um, some um, uh, cortical malformations such as polymicrogyria, periventricular calcifications, um, anterior temporal abnormalities such as um, abnormal uh, white matter T2 prolongation and cysts, and then abnormal um, patterns of myelination um, such as uh, um, dysmyelination in the posterior periventricular white matter. Um, and uh, earlier infections, you might see more severe cortical malformations um, and cerebellar um, anomalies as well. Um, toxoplasmosis has more of a tendency toward um, normocephaly or even macrocephaly. Um, the patients will have enlarged ventricles from the ependymitis, and um, you will see uh, hydrocephalus as well as multiple scattered um, uh, coarser calcifications. Um, Zika virus infection, you would look for a profound microcephaly and um, calcifications with a tendency for uh, location at the gray-white junction. Um, as well as cortical malformations on the more severe end of the spectrum, such as cobblestone uh, malformation. Congenital HIV, the patients tend to be closer to being uh, normocephalic, and you may see characteristic calcifications in the basal ganglia and bilateral frontal uh, white matter, um, as well as um, uh, possibly aneurysms um, or stroke in later uh, course of disease. <laughs>
So next, um, we're going to move on to um, CNS infection and its complications um, outside of the realm of congenital infections. So we're going to look for certain patterns in pediatric central nervous system infections. First, we're going to talk about viral diseases um, and focus on uh, herpes simplex virus infection, which is a very important and potentially devastating infection. Um, and one of the key points that I'm going to go over is that extratemporal involvement um, and atypical patterns are more likely than in adults, so just have a high index of suspicion, and we'll talk about some of the findings that you might see. Patterns of other viral encephalitides, and then we'll talk about bacterial meningoencephalitis. The role of imaging in these cases, rather than to diagnose meningitis, really, which is um, better done uh, clinically and with um, CSF analysis, et cetera, but the role of imaging is more helpful uh, often in, in cases with an uncertain diagnosis where other things besides infection are in the differential. Um, in cases of recurrent meningitis, where we might be looking for an underlying predisposing lesion or even an, uh, an, an anatomic variant that might be predisposing the patient to infection. Um, such as, as a cephalocele or a dermoid with dermal sinus tract or something like that. Um, and then we'll talk about what the complications of meningitis look like. And uh, it may also have, um, uh, imaging also has an important role in treatment monitoring and seeing if the patient is responding to antibiotics. So first we'll talk about congenital and neonatal herpes simplex virus infection. So the congenital and in utero herpes simplex herpes simplex virus infections are uh, pretty rare, representing less than 5%. And they're usually from uh, primary maternal infection. So a, a mother who has not been infected until um, the time of gestation. And uh, they uh, may result in fetal hydrops uh, or demise, especially uh, earlier in gestation. Um, but uh, patients who are affected in the third trimester may have uh, extensive encephalomalacia. So here is a patient with congenital um, herpes simplex virus infection. You can see this was a zero-day-old zero term infant, and there was extensive encephalomalacia here in both cerebral hemispheres and ventriculomegaly, exvacuo dilatation of ventricles, uh, enlargement of the subarachnoid spaces. So very, very devastating. Um, okay, so that brings us to our next question, which neonatal herpes simplex virus infection involves the temporal lobes more than 90% of the time about two thirds of the time, about a third of the time, or less than 10% of the time. So we've got 90%, we've got two thirds. Anybody for a less common? Okay, it looks like two thirds is kind of taking on um, the lead and that is actually the correct answer. So two thirds of the time. Um, so it still has a predilection for the uh, temporal lobes but not as much as um, in the reactivation disease in older patients. So um, congenital and neonatal herpes simplex virus infection um, is, a, these are kind of some of the points that make it different. It can be caused by either herpes simplex virus one or herpes simplex virus two, whereas the reactivation disease is more associated with HSV-1 infection. There's a less predictable predilection for the insula, temporal lobe, and limbic system in general. An important teaching point is to treat uh, the patients if there's clinical suspicion. Even if initial viral testing is negative, there's a 25% false negative rate for CSF uh, PCR in infants, which is um, a higher false negative rate than it is in older patients. And um, you might even need to tap a second time. And 30% of the patients will present with an isolated CS CNS infection without a rash, which is an important teaching point as well. So the patients tend to present around two weeks of life with nonspecific symptoms, for example, fuzzy, fussiness, seizures, and uh, altered mental status such as lethargy and coma. So here is an example of a patient with um, herpes simplex virus infection where you can see uh, abnormal low diffusivity within the anterior temporal lobe and some leptomeningeal enhancement here um, so that uh, eventually this area might turn into an area of encephalomalacia. Here's another example. So areas of hemorrhage are very, very common in neonatal HSV infection. Here's a patient who on the T2-weighted sequence, you can see this big T2 hypo-intense hemorrhage with lots of edema around it and uh, some more hemorrhage here, more anteriorly within the temporal lobe and also some um, leptomeningeal enhancement. 
Um, one really important thing, this is a clinical pearl that I learned from my mentor, Dr. Pruthi, is that um, you can have more scattered uh, uh, lesions. So this appearance is really, really commonly seen. So you uh, just kind of scattered little nonspecific looking areas of low diffusivity um, or even um, lesions that are in vascular territories because the transmission of infection is hematogenous in infants rather than representing reactivation from the Gessarian ganglion as you may see in reactivation HSV infection. So here's the kind of more common one that shares more um, uh, of an overlap with the appearance of the disease in adult patients. So this is the reactivation of um, HSV1 that occurs in older children. So um, I was surprised to learn that such a high proportion of these cases occurs in the pediatric uh, age group, especially in very, very young patients. So a third of all of the cases of reaction, reactivation, herpes simplex virus um, encephalitis occur between six months and three years of age, uh, whereas uh, the, the majority, so more than 50% occur in uh, elderly patients. Um, but there uh, is there tends to be involvement of the limbic system, including the temporal lobe and the insula because of reactivation from the cranial nerve five ganglion. And um, but it is important to remember that extra temporal patterns of disease are more common in children. So here was an article by um, Dr. Bykowski and all um, showing some of the atypical appearances and locations of lesions in pediatric HSV encephalitis. So here is a patient who had some basal ganglia involvement. Here is a patient with frontal lobe involvement. You may also see parietal lobe involvement. So don't let that dissuade you from, from making that diagnosis. So moving on to some of the other viral encephalitis that one might see. So when there is a symmetric involvement of the deep gray, mat deep gray matter, as from this case, which I got um, from Dr. Anton uh, that was posted on Radiopedia, so Epstein-Barr virus infection can produce a pattern like this. Um, arbovirus infections can also do this. Okay, so the next uh, question. So click on the area that you think uh, might be abnormal. And there may be more than one correct answer in this case. This is an 11 month old with flaccid paralysis and recent hand, foot, and mouth disease. Okay, so we've got some votes for the thalamus. This is a really tricky, this is kind of an eye test. Any other thoughts? Okay, somebody is saying the brainstem there, the, the dorsal medulla. Okay, great. So, um, so the correct answer is actually the dorsal medulla and the dorsal pond. So I don't actually definitely see anything abnormal in that image there. Um, so the primary abnormality in this case was in the dorsal brainstem and the dorsal medulla. This was really, really tricky and as was actually um, initially overlooked. But here you can see when you compare to a, a newborn neonate, see, we know that the dorsal brainstem and the medulla are myelinated at birth. Um, and uh, so here's what it usually looks like. Usually it's T2 hypointense. So when you're seeing these T2 hyperintense areas in the in the um, in these locations, this is actually abnormal. And um, here is another image from that case, which showed uh, gray matter involvement in the spinal cord, which was actually more obvious than the brainstem findings. Um, and this was because of acute flaccid myelitis due to enterovirus A71 infection. So you may also see this with enterovirus D68 infection. And here in the US, we see kind of biannual um, occurrence of, of this disease. And um, these are um, non-polio enteroviruses and the patients may present with either like a GI illness or a hand, this patient presented with hand, foot, mouth disease, which is another uh, manifestation of that. So these are leukotropic viruses that have a tendency um, to go toward uh, the neurons. Another example of that that we see, in fact, this year we saw a big spike in these cases is a parechovirus infection, which has a very distinctive appearance. So here are, is a montage of six different neonates who had human parechovirus infection, and these are their DWI images. So you see these very, very characteristic kind of branching areas of diffusion abnormality, involvement of the uh, corpus callosum, involvement of the internal capsule. 
Um, and uh, this, this imaging, um, these imaging findings, while characteristic of parechovirus infection, so these are typically well, initially well term infants who come home after uh, from the hospital and then after uh, several days of life may uh, present uh, back with fevers and uh, lethargy, et cetera, seizures. Um, but uh, these, uh, this entity may overlap with other viral infections, such as enterovirus, chikungunya, or uh, rotavirus infections. Um, there may also be some um, overlap with hypoxic ischemic injury. However, the clinical scenario that I gave you is quite different. Um, and then cerebellitis. So there are many viruses that can cause cerebellitis. There are also non-viral entities that can cause cerebellitis. Um, Varicella zoster virus is one of the more common ones. This is Epstein-Barr virus cerebellitis, which is also um, one of the more common ones that we can see. There are various patterns, and it's important to note that these can overlap with tumor or subacute infarcts. And we had a case recently of pseudotumoral hemicerebellitis. We never did find out what the underlying cause was, but um, the way that the diagnosis was ultimately made was by following up um, after the patient had some steroids and uh, clinically had improved and the imaging findings had also improved and there was volume loss in that area of the cerebellum. Um, so without any um, other uh, treatments. Um, and then um, uh, this, this brings us to the next question. So which agent is most commonly associated with this appearance? So these are uh, three uh, DWI images here at different levels. And here is a um, gradient echo sequence here on the bottom left. So it's A, human herpes virus 6. B, Epstein-Barr virus, C, cytomegalovirus, D, influenza virus, or E, West Nile virus. So we've got these very uh, bad looking areas of cytotoxic edema involving much of the supertentorial white matter. Um, we've got bilateral symmetric involvement of the thalami, which appear very swollen with these uh, ring-like uh, lesions on the DWI and some areas of hemorrhage that you can see on the gradient echo sequence. Um, you can also see involvement of the brainstem in this case, as well as the temporal uh, white matter, and then some involvement of the cerebellum. So a pretty severe case of this disorder. So we've got some votes for CMV and some votes for West Nile virus. So actually, um, the correct answer in this case is uh, influenza. So this is an example of acute necrotizing encephalopathy of childhood. Um, it's pretty rare. I've seen uh, two cases in our institution since um, joining the faculty five years ago, and I've seen one case that um, somebody asked me about from another institution, so quite rare. And um, the most common pathogen that's associated with this, it's, it's actually sort of an abnormal inflammatory response um, uh, rather than a direct effect of the viral infection. So influenza is most common. Um, Parainfluenza and, and others, including COVID, have been reported as causes of this disorder. And it's a very devastating. Most of the patients, um, unfortunately, um, end up being deceased. Um, most of the cases are sporadic, but it has been associated with this uh, mutation in a gene called RANBP2. Um, you can also get diffuse cerebral edema from viral infections. Here is an example of diffuse edema from um, influenza. And it's important to remember that sometimes the agent can't be found because I've shown you a lot of cases where the where the imaging findings overlap with non-infectious uh, entities. So um, cases we've seen where we've um, ended up having to give a di differential where ultimately no answer was found include demyelinating conditions such as ADEM, uh, you know, where you can see bilateral fluffy scattered lesions that might involve deep gray and white matter. Um, autoimmune encephalitidy, such as anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis, um, atypical posterior reversible encephalopathy syndrome, or PRESS, um, or even metabolic diseases. So here is one example of those uh, kind of troublesome cases where we never found an underlying cause, but this patient has bilateral um, basal ganglia lesions. There's probably some involvement of the thalami, um, and then this kind of cortical involvement here that you can see in both frontal lobes on these flare images. Um, so, uh, in discussing pediatric meningitis and so moving on to bacterial infections, 
The probable causal agent in pediatric meningitis will depend on the age and immune status of the patient. So there are different pathogens uh, have greater tendency to affect uh, patients on, on the basis of immune status um, and as well as vaccination status. Um, disease can spread hematogenously, usually via the choroid plexus, which is a highly vascular structure, of course, or due to direct inoculation from trauma or foreign body or secondary to head and neck infection. So this is a more common in older patients who've had more time to pneumatize their sinuses and mastoids, of course. Um, and uh, meningitis is more common in premature newborns and earlier infancy because of the weaker immune systems. And in this population, there is high morbidity and mortality. Uh, we'll go over some of those um, specific entities a little bit later. And uh, later on, the subarachnoid space becomes protective against these infections, except for against neurotropic agents such as um, Citrobacter and Enterobacter, which we'll also discuss. So what are we looking for as the manifestations of the these uh, bacterial meningitides. So I wanted to start with a pitfall. So um, I often find that when I'm working uh, with residents and fellows, and I remember also from when I was starting out, it was really tricky on MRI uh, to decide whether I was seeing um, evidence of leptomeningitis or not. So an important thing to remember is that when patients are under anesthesia for MRI or receiving administered oxygen, or they've had a previous LP, you can see some hyperintensity of the sulci uh, the, the sulcal subarachnoid space on flare, as you can see here, here, um, so um, here, and also you can see on the post contrast um, sequence here that rather than being uh, very confluent and conforming to the shape of the sulci, you can see this kind of dot like quality because these are actually probably related to small uh, vessels. Um, and here's another example of uh, an entity that can give you sulcal flare hyperintensity that is not. Uh, meningitis. So here you can see that going on in the right posterior quadrant. Um, and here uh, on the post-contrast um, T1-weighted sequence, you can see this was a case of moya moya. So you can see all of these um, collaterals within the um, bilateral sylvian cisterns in this patient with moya moya disease. So um, rather, this was that example of the anesthesia patient before, but um, sulcal, so it in meningitis, uh, when you do see signs on um, imaging, Here's an example on ultrasound where you can see like very thick hyperechoic appearance of the sulci. Um, on MRI, you tend to see more uh, like confluent enhancement that you can see conforming to the shape of a sulcus and you can see it oftentimes on, on multiple slices. It just has a more confluent appearance than, than these um, other uh, sort of mimics. And it may be diffuse as in this case, this is, this is a very helpful sequence sometimes. So the post-contrast flare, um, it kind of takes away the contribution of the vascular enhancement. So it can also um, help you a lot of the time uh, identify subtle leptomeningeal enhancement, um, or it can uh, involve the basilar cisterns here. You can see this uh, very uh, confluent uh, basilar cistern enhancement, which you might see in fungal or TB um, meningitis. Uh, and as I said before, you, you'll, you're more likely to see it on multiple um, sequential slices. Um, cerebritis. So this is infection of the brain parenchyma itself. So this um, can be because of hematogenous infection, but um, often in our practice, we see it's because the patient has an infection with um, an extra axial collection, so that, such as this subdural collection here. And you can see that there's early cerebritis in this uh, patient who has a history of, of sinusitis. You can see that the cortex is slightly hyperintense on flare, and there's uh, effacement of the sulci when you compare it to the contralateral side. Here's another example of a patient who had cerebritis. So you can see bilateral frontal uh, T2 parenchymal T, uh, prolongation. And then on DWI, you'll see these areas of um, cytotoxic edema. Here's an example of the literature of how this cerebritis can um, sometimes um, um, progress to abscess over the course of time. So follow-up imaging can be quite important for these patients. So here's an example of a patient who had some pretty striking diffusion abnormalities, but very little in the way there may be some uh, very minor enhancement in these areas on the post-contrast sequence. But then seven days later, all of those areas had progressed into um, these rim-enhancing abscesses. <clears throat> 
Um, another important um, finding that we're looking for um, is thrombosis. And so here is an interesting example of a patient who did have um, a sigmoid and transverse sinus thrombosis from mastoiditis. Here you can see um, there's also some subperiosteal um, inflammation and some scalp inflammation here external to the skull. Um, but they also had an epidural abscess. So you can see that the transverse sinus is displaced away from the bone and there's an epidural abscess next to it. And there's a filling defect here that's consistent with thrombosis. Um, you can also see vasculitis um, with infarcts, which we'll talk about a little bit more. So here is a patient with streptococcal um, pneumonia meningitis, and you can see these um, basal, basal ganglia and thalamic infarcts. Um, here's a patient with cavernous sinus thrombosis, a patient who had um, sinusitis. So because the cavernous sinus is associated with um, communication with valveless veins from the face, these kinds of infections can cause um, filling defects and expansion of the cavernous sinus, as you can see here on the left, greater than right with decreased opacification. And here is an example of thrombosis of the superior sagittal sinus. So these gradient echo 3D T1 related sequences are sort of the workhorse for identifying um, some of these thromboses. And this one was very extensive and had resulted in some um, venous infarcts. Okay, so the next question, um, the, the abnormal frontal fluid collection seen in this case are most likely A, epidural effusions, B, epidural abscesses, C, subdural empyemas, or D, subarachnoid effusions. So we've got uh, subdural empyemas and subarachnoid effusions. No one's really going for the epidural. Nope, oh, somebody chimed in on that one. So, so um, excellent. So this is something that I actually uh, didn't know until after I'd finished fellowship and I was working as an attending um, when I encountered uh, many cases of meningitis that looked like this with these uh, convexity extraaxial collections, because there are areas of uh, low diffusivity in there, I used to think that these represented subdural empyemas, um, but I was kind of I was kind of corrected. So here's there's um, some leptomeningeal enhancement, which you can see here. But um, these are this is actually infection uh, or an inflammation extending along the vein that are traversing the subarachnoid space. So these, um, in spite of the low diffusivity, are probably better characterized as subarachnoid effusions. So um, we saw that example here. This is a more typical appearance of a subdural um, empyema. So here was a patient, um, this is kind of a, a rare infection, but a two-week-old who presented with M. hominis infection. That's like a commensal, a vaginal commensal organism. Um, that was transmitted during the birth process. So you can see these typical findings of low diffusivity that's quite confluent in the subdural collection that would need to be surgically drained and a rim around it, like a very uh, prominent enhancing rim um, that you can see here. And the fluid does not suppress on flare. So the flare is often really, really good for looking for these subdural collections. And that's the main role because not so useful for the parenchyma in, in young infants because of the lack of um, gray-white differentiation. Um, and then um, here's uh, here's some more examples. So an ultrasound, ultrasound is really quite good for these in patients with open fontanelles. So here you can see the external arachnoid limiting membrane as this line that's separating the subarachnoid space from this subdural collection, which is um, hypoechoic here. Um, here's an example on the flare showing an interhemispheric fissure subdural collection. Um, here, the coronal images can be quite helpful to see the ones that are collecting along the inferior aspects of the frontal lobe. So that's always part of my search pattern. Here was an interesting case of a patient with sinusitis whose initial head CT, one could almost walk by this little tiny dot of gas um, adjacent to the frontal sinus. But here um, you can see um, when you uh, did, did a follow-up in a couple of days, there was an epidural abscess with some internal gas here. And here's another example of those um, subarachnoid effusions with the crossing vessels and some enhancement. Uh, ependymitis. So um, you can get ependymal inflammation, which can lead to hydrocephalus. So here's an example of a patient with very severe ependymitis, and you can form all these walled-off cysts within the ventricular system, which can be very, very hard to treat. They may not communicate with one another, so the neurosurgical management of these patients may be quite complex. And when you're doing the follow-up in these patients, it's important to evaluate all the areas separately. 
Um, but here's another example of a patient with a shunt um, with that uh, kind of insisted appearance of the ventricles. Another finding you may look for is um, pus within the ventricles, which you can see very well here on DWI. So there's low diffusivity layering within the occipital horns of the lateral ventricles. So that's always in my search pattern because these may just be tiny dots, but you should always look for them. Um, and here is an example of a patient with um, ependymal uh, hyperechogenicity that you can see on ultrasound. And you may also see um, pus uh, or like low level echoes layering within the ventricles. Abscesses. So this is not uh, an eye test, unlike one of the earlier cases I showed you, but there are multiple lesions here. This was a patient with um, a strep uh, intermediate infection. You can see multiple um, of these abscesses with, with characteristic low diffusivity. You can see lots and lots of edema around these lesions, uh, ring enhancement. And then this is a helpful sign. Every now and again, we get one where it's unknown whether these are, uh, you know, usually with a solitary lesion, whether it's an abscess or a tumor, but you can look for signs on imaging, such as this dual rim sign that you can see on susceptibility weighted imaging. So inside this hyperintense line represents granulation tissue and the outer um, hypointense line is um, hemosiderin deposition in the fibrocollagenous capsule. So that can be quite a helpful. You can also see this on T2 and flare sometimes. Um, and finally, it's it's very important to look for um, labyrinthitis. So here are two of the, uh, the key players, so strep pneumo and H. influenzae. Meningitis are known for causing um, labyrinthitis. Um, so this was a tip that was taught to me by Dr. Robson from my fellowship, and now I always look for this. So here you can see in the left um, cochlea, this very avid enhancement in this patient with um, strep pneumomeningitis. And here is a patient with hemophilus um, influenzae, and you can see the hypo-intense signal on T2 within the cochlea and the semicircular canals with accompanying enhancement. And the reason why it's important to identify this in the acute stage is if it can be treated in the, um, the, fi the fibrous uh, stage, then it, then it can be uh, the permanent hearing loss and contraindication to cochlear implantation might be prevented. So by the time you get to labyrinthitis ossificans, which is a late complication of meningitis, um, you can get, um, this was a patient with sickle cell disease and strep pneumomeningitis who later developed labyrinth labyrinthitis ossificans. Um, the ossific form with um, dense uh, mineralization with, within the cochlea and the semicircular canals of the vestibule you can see here. So it would be difficult, as you can imagine, to pass um, an implant electrode into that cochlea. So finally, um, infants with meningitis, there are some special considerations. Um, I just uh, think that this, there's some interesting literature on this topic, but some certain features in these cases can suggest a certain agent, although no feature is pathognomonic, but we'll just give you an idea of, of some things you could look for with these different um, entities. So Number one, um, streptococcal species. And I found these actually to be quite reliable um, and seen in, in a large proportion of these patients. So you tend to see um, infarcts in streptococcal meningitis in uh, young infants. So here is an example of a patient. You can see all these little areas of cytotoxic edema within the um, subcortical white matter, within the uh, striatal nuclei, the thalami. Um, and these are just very typical. And so these represent small vessel vasculitis um, or you can even see large vessels. So this in the same patient, you can see that there was um, occlusion of the MCA and um, the vertebral artery had been seen on an MRI a, a few days earlier, but then had occluded um, by the time we got to this study here. And then you can see leptomeningeal enhancement. And, and I've noticed this um, uh, interesting confluent um, leptomeningeal enhancement along the course of the um, the cortical veins. So something that I wondered is, is if this predisposes patients to cortical venous thrombosis, which is a complication that we see quite often in these patients. Um, and you can also see white matter lesions. With the E. coli meningitis, on the other hand, um, ventriculitis and hydrocephalus are the more common um, patterns of involvement that you might see. So here was a patient who was a 23-day-old patient who had E. coli infection and um, was developing uh, hydrocephalus. So the ventricles are already a little bit enlarged, but you can see this leptomeningeal enhancement um, along the ependymal surface. And then um, the patient went home, but three months later came back to um, neurology clinic and was found to have an increased head circumference. And so um, uh, on the rapid hydrocephalus um, MRI that was ordered, you can see this, um, this really profound um, ventriculomegaly. They can also get basilar meningitis. 
And as I had mentioned earlier, Citrobacter and Enterobacter, these are neurotropic agents that tend to gravitate toward the white matter. So in these cases, you can see these very distinctive um, squared off large abscesses in the paraventricular white matter, which are uh, quite typical in this case here. So um, in summary, um, we'll talk about um, some of the highlights of the second half of the presentation. So herpes simplex virus has different imaging patterns in neonates and older children. In neonates, the imaging manifestations are quite variable, but they tend to present around two weeks with hemorrhage and diffusion abnormality, which may be these little scattered um, spots and dots, vascular territorial involvement, um, or you know, kind of more focal involvement in the temporal lobe, as you can see in that case. Um, they also have leptomeningeal enhancement. They may have cerebral edema. The older patients are more like adult patients, although atypical patterns are more common in children than in adults. Um, initial CSF testing can be negative, so um, have high suspicion and treat with antiviral agents early on because um, this is a devastating disease that has an available treatment. Um, key points for the viral infections outside of HSV are that they have a lot of imaging overlap with other conditions. Um, so follow-up and ancillary testing can be key, and um, understanding the myelination pattern can raise sensitivity for neurotropic infections in infants, which can be quite tricky, such as that case of enterovirus um, encephalitis that I showed, or acute flaccid myelitis that I showed you. Um, secondly, pediatric bacterial CNS infection um, sources include direct infection, hematogenous spread, and head and neck infections, um, and the source affects the imaging pattern of potential complications, so where you might look for them. Uh, premature infants, neonates, and immunosuppressed children are at greatest risk for meningitis, and keen awareness of the potential short and long-term complications are generally more important than diagnosing meningitis or suggesting the causal agent, which uh, can be found by other means. So thank you so much for your attention. I've included my contact information here. Um, if anybody would like to reach out to me, I'm always happy to see your cases or um, to learn from you as well. Um, and so now I think I can take um, some questions. Is that right, Shiva? You're right. So um, thank you, Dr. Sama, for this wonderful lecture. The images you had put in your presentation were very clear and precise. Also, we appreciate your efforts for using these polls, which made the lecture even more interactive. And I'm pretty sure that this lecture was well received by our audience. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, so I do not, as of now, I do not see any questions in the Q&A box, but I do have two questions for you. Sure. So you mentioned that almost like 25% of the HSV meningitis cases show false negative microbiological tests. And we have to start the treatment immediately based on the imaging findings. So I assume that this might be the case with many other CNS infections when you have these false negative results and you have to uh, rely on the uh, radiological diagnosis for treatment. So have you encountered any incidences where imaging has misdiagnosed these, in, these infections leading to uh, wrong treatment, uh, given that there might be some overlap in the imaging findings of these CNS infections? That's a really good question. I think at the institutions that I've um, been at, I uh, more often than not, infectious disease colleagues are involved earlier rather than later. And the tendency is to start broad. And so they will st start with broad um, antimicrobial treatments. I think any uh, young infant presenting with um, these the kind of uh, findings concerning for infection would always receive acyclovir um, until further testing can be pursued. But I think with the bacterial infections, there's a much lower false negative rate. And so um, once, you know, sometimes after the patient's gotten antibiotics, it can be hard to identify an agent, but um, they tend to narrow based on um, the information they have after initially starting with broad um, antibiotics. All right, I got it. Thank you very much. And my second question is that while you were showing the DWI images of bacterial uh, cerebritis, I noticed that there was frontal lobe which was predominantly involved. So is that a predisposition or is it just uh, diffuse cerebritis? That's a really good question. And I think that um, harkens back to the teaching point that some of it depends on the reason why the patient has cerebritis. 
most of the cases that I've seen um, in our practice are uh, usually because of a local head and neck infection. So you can imagine if you've got um, sinus, like for example, frontal sinusitis, it would be those frontal lobes. So looking, uh, you know, trying to identify the infectious source and looking close to that for these subtle signs. I showed you that early, early signs of cerebritis without diffusion abnormality that you could see on the flare. So it's important to scrutinize those areas that are um, adjacent to the source. All right, thank you very much. Um, I do not see any questions. So you are very clear with your lecture. Nobody has any questions. <laughs> well, feel free to reach out and um, I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Yeah. And um, I also wanted to say these recommended readings were really useful to me in putting together the presentation. I'd recommend them to everybody who's attending, so. All right, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Have a good rest of the Have day. Have a good day. Thank you.